Hey everyone, um, my name is Graham Taylor. Um, these are my colleagues. This is Elliot to my left and Andrew. Everybody here, you, you probably just like hit the jackpot because not only do you get to hear one talk, you get to hear three. And oh, if I, if I leave like after I've done my bit, it's not because I don't want to answer your questions. <laughs> um, it's because there's a scheduling clash and I'm actually meant to be presenting downstairs as well. And I couldn't clone myself in time. Um, at the Bahat Lab, so um, if you do have any questions for me, then we've got a stand, come and see me, um, but hopefully these guys will be able to answer your questions if you have any. Um, so let's get started. Who are we? Um, so we, are, we work for Capgemini. Um, some of you probably know Capgemini, uh, or I guess most of you probably do, we're a large multinational um, organization, we, are, we do Drupal, that's only a small slice of the pie in the organization as you can imagine, but it is growing. Um, most of our Drupal projects, at least the biggest ones, are based out of the UK, uh, but we also have Drupal teams in France, in India, Belgium, Sweden, and the Netherlands. Um, in the UK, we are around 30 Drupal developers strong. Um, and yeah, we have a stand here, as I mentioned before, we're giving away kazoos, so come along, um, give us a tune on the kazoo, we'll record you, put it on YouTube, and you can win some prizes. Um, so what do we do? Here are some of the clients that we work with. Um, our biggest project in the UK is the Royal Mail, which also includes Parcel Force and the post office websites. Um, Royal Mail, just to give you some stats, uh, on average, is doing around 21 million commerce orders per year. Um, our next biggest project is probably Eurostar, um, which is averaging around 2 million in revenue per day. Um, so obviously, as you can see, we do big sites. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about building a scalable developer workflow. So let's drill into that a little bit. Um, the first thing you're going to need is developer, obviously. Um, if, if, if you're doing things at scale, it's likely you're going to have more than one. Um, so you're going to have multiple developers. Um, first thing I think is that's really important is that you, you have the right people on the bus um, and the right blend of people as well. So it, you, you need to decide, do you need um, three senior developers, one mid-level, one junior, a tester, a business analyst? Um, it's really important that you have the right blend of people in your development team because it's really important to get off on the right foot. I've seen projects um, starting where we basically a massive projects start, no developers um, arrive on day one. It's just lots of other people, other disciplines. Um, so not, not really any technical people on the project at all. Things, decisions are being made, things are, can get out of hand. Um, you, you, sh you should always have a technical input, I believe, at the start of your projects. Um, I've also seen other projects where we have like many junior developers. Um, the blend isn't quite right. And again, think things don't exactly get off on the right foot and you kind of end up with a burden or things that you need to fix while the project's in flight, which becomes more difficult. Aside from having the right people on the bus, you also need to make sure that everybody has what they need to do their job. So make sure your development team is tooled up. Um, make sure they are in a comfortable environment. All, like, all these things are fairly obvious, right? Th these are some of the tools that we use. It, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as you know what you're going to use and as long as you, you have everything you need when you start a project. Um, so yeah, we use Atlassian, PHP Storm. Um, Xdebug, that one's really important for your developers. Get every developer get them set up properly with a development environment um, so that they have everything they need and everything at their disposal to, to work properly. Um, the amount of times I've um, had, to, had to help people get set up because they're not quite able to work as productively as they could have. Um, so make sure that's really important. Make sure they, they have everything. Um, so, so back to the back to the. I've talked a little bit about developers and what you kind of about blend of people and what they need. Um, so let's talk a little bit about workflow. 
Um, so the, f the first thing is communication. It's, it's really is key. It doesn't really, you can have the best workflow in the world, but if nobody talks to each other, things will fall apart. So make sure you have, you decide on your communication channels, like if you, are you gonna use Skype? Are you gonna use IRC? Um, and are you gonna have regular daily stand-ups? How your project's gonna work? Make sure you decide on that all up front and you know how you're gonna communicate with your developers and with your client and how, the, how you can bridge the gap between your developers and your client as well. Um, yeah, and, and, and don't run before you can walk. Um, don't promise one million things to your client on day one or don't, or don't sell a project on a Friday and, and expect your team to be fully up and running on the Monday. Um, if you can, what, what we try and do is, is have like bootstrap iterations um, where we go in and tool up and set up, and, and that may last four weeks, it may last eight weeks, it's, it depends on the size of the project, but make sure, I would recommend you do this and spend time up front with your development team to make sure they have the processes and tools in place to do their job properly, because it'll make your life a hell of a lot easier. Um, if you try and do these things mid-flight, it's painful. Um, clarity of purpose, your, your team, this is really important because you, you, your team, without knowing how to do th anything, nothing will start. And without knowing what's done, you'll never finish. Without knowing what's good, you'll inevitably end up taking shortcuts in your approach or um, just to get the job done. So the team really needs to know how to do things well, what it means to get things done, and what good looks like. So I guess, if you're going to set up a developer workflow, the first thing you're going to need is version control. Um, I'm probably telling you all to like suck eggs, right? it's, it's pretty obvious. Um, m most people nowadays use Git, but you can use SVN if you want, or you can use something else, but I, I'd recommend Git. Um, because pretty soon, what's going to happen when you start building things, and especially if you're doing things at scale as well, what, what you're going to want to do is have lots of things happening in parallel. Um, for example, on the Royal Mail project, we have a larger development team, which at the moment is about 20 developers. Um, that's all split up into like sub teams within the larger development team. So we have about six streams or like six sub teams of like maybe four, three, six. It depends on what the nature of the work is. And they're all doing things in parallel. Um, so one team may be doing new, fix new features, one may be doing bug fixes, one may be doing enhancements, but that's all happening at the same time. And that's all coming together in the end. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about how that all comes together. Um, but yeah, version control is really key, so you can, you can have branches and um, lots of things happening in parallel. And for workflow, like you don't need to reinvent the wheel um, if, for like your Git workflow. So, Example, we use um, the Git flow workflow. We find it is a good fit for us, but um, check that link, there's other workflows on there. It really depends what, how, you want, how your project wants to work. Pick one that suits you, but I would advise not to invent a completely new workflow. Um, pick one that's already established and documented on the web. Standards. This is kind of links back to my clarity of purpose, like your team needs to know how to do things and what good looks like. So we already have these things available, the dripping, Drupal coding standards. Your team should follow those if they're writing Drupal modules. Um, I mentioned on the tools page that we, one of the tools we had there was PHP Storm. We like to use that a lot. If you check out those two articles, that'll give you help to get your IDE configured properly for Drupal projects. Um, so I'd recommend, like I love PHP Storm, but I'm not gonna get into like IDE wars in, in this, in this uh, session. Um, but yeah, if you like PHP Storm, check, check those out. Make sure you, if you want to use it, get your developers set up, get them all set up in the same way. Um, so it's easy, people can help each other, people can pair program together. 
it just, it just makes it, those things a lot easier. Um, and then finally, commit messages. So yeah, check that link. Make sure your commit message is basically no. Um, don't assume that the reviewer of the code knows what the original problem was. And in your commit message, make it descriptive about why, et cetera, et cetera. Um, code review. So this graph, um, I'll explain it a little bit. The top, the top graph is the percentage of code committed over time that has been reviewed. And the bottom graph is the number of bugs raised per week over the same time period. And this is like a graph f there from one of our projects. Um, as you can see, as more code is being reviewed, we, we have less bugs. Always make sure that you do code review. It's the same for like Drupal 8, right? Any patch can't get into Drupal 8 without being reviewed by at least two other people. So a core committer can't commit it until it's been RTBC'd by at least two others. Um, for code review, we use Crucible, which is a part of that Atlassian stack. But if you're using things like GitHub or whatever, that's got code review tools built in. You can use other tools too, like Fabricator, which is a Facebook code review tool. Pick one that fits best for you and review code. Testing. So if you, I would highly recommend, if you, if you can, to do either test-driven development or behavior-driven development. And Andrew is going to speak uh, slightly later on about behavior-driven development and the kind of things we do at Capgemini related to that. But it, it's really important to know how you're going to test your code before you even write a single line. So are you going to test it manually? Are you going to write a PHP unit test for that? Are you going to write a BHAT test? Um, and if you have tests, particularly a PHP unit or BHAT tests, you can automate all those things. So you can have your tests running uh, on commit, on a nightly build, um, before a developer pushes to a branch, etc. You can slice and dice however you want once you have these things in place. Um, which leads me on to builds. If you can, you should automate everything. And that, and that includes automating your environments as well. So the creation of your test environment, the creation of your UAT environment. Um, we use, so these are some of the tools that we use internally. Um, so yeah, logo on the top left is Puppet. So that's for environment automation. Thing, we use that to build files or build the Drupal site files in combination with Rushmake. Uh, we use Capistrano for deployment of that to like clustered machines. So if you have to deploy uh, your web application, which includes a bunch of files and a database to 15 different machines, mm -hmm. Capistrano can handle that quite nicely. Uh, we use Jenkins for running overnight builds of, uh, so we refresh our test environment daily, or we use Jenkins to trigger PHP unit tests, things like that. But I would highly recommend setting up a continuous integration environment at the start of your project, because it allows you to fail fast and fail early, and allows you to catch issues before you deploy it to production. And it allows you to practice your deployment to production on a daily basis. And, and you should deploy often, including to production. You should deploy often to production, as often as you can. Um, so yeah, I would highly recommend setting it up at the start of a project. I've seen projects where that didn't have a build system or a continuous integration system, and halfway through, it's had to be implemented because there was lots of issues, um, lots of bugs leaking into production, um, no way to build a known state of the code, and implementing that halfway through a project is, is very painful, and you will inevitably end up taking shortcuts to, to, to get it in there. So spend the time up front to set this up. And I mentioned some tools that we use on the previous slide, but it doesn't really matter what you use. So you can use whatever you want. 
as long as it's reliable and repeatable, it's good. So you can have everything in shell scripts if you want. It's up to you. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that, but um, as long as it's reliable and repeatable, you're doing the same thing all the time then, and it works, it doesn't matter. And have your developers work smarter, not harder. So although the Royal Mail Dot com is on Drupal 6. Uh, we still try to use object-oriented patterns wherever possible. Um, we're using some components from Symfony, so we're using the event dispatcher and various other things. So we're, we're borrowing concepts and tools from the PHP community that are invented elsewhere. So, and if anybody listened to the Dries note, or to Alex Potts' presentation yesterday, um, the line was from not invented here to proudly found elsewhere. So always try and reuse others' code if it's stable, reliable, and tested. Um, and you don't have to be on Drupal 8 to use um, Symfony. We're, 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 we're already doing it on a Drupal 6 project. We're using Guzzle on a Drupal 6 project as well. Um, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just PHP at the end of the day. Um, and in terms of working smarter, not harder, yet yeah, automate as much as you can. Anytime you have a manual step in your deployment process, something will go wrong. Somebody will forget to do that on the, on the night of the release. Um, so yeah. And aside from that, trust your developers. Let them, let them experiment on things, whether that be um, a component from Symfony that might help your team. Maybe don't do it like right in a live project, but let them experiment. What we do at Capgemini is we have every second Friday, we have a whole day. Our developers can basically do whatever they want for that whole day. They can hack on AngularJS if they want, on Node.js. Um, it just allows them a bit of freedom to experiment. And, and some of the things that we hack on in those days end up going into live projects. So the benefit is coming back to your teams um, all the time. And lastly, don't be afraid to fail. Like failure is inevitable. It's what you learn and how you improve that matters. Um, in, in relation to the experimentation, it's always good if you don't fail in a, in a live project. So if you can and you want to do experiment, experiment, experimental projects and try and do them on the side, we have an innovation team at Capgemini that's currently working on things like AngularJS and Node.js. And some of the work that they've been doing is actually going to come into our, our project. So we're now looking at using AngularJS on the RoyalMail.com, for example. Um, as part of a new journey, things like that. So, yeah, don't be afraid to try things. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, we're all here to learn. Um, as long as you're getting value at the end of the day after that failure, then that's good. Um, so, in summary, linking back to my clarity of purpose, your team must know how to do things. So, I, I went over the Git workflow, coding standards, what tools to use. Um, they must know the definition of done. So that means, does that mean your code has been reviewed? It's, it's, it's got correct documentation. It's got a unit test applied with it. It has a behat test applied with it. Um, you need to define these things. Of, and then finally, what good looks like. So um, if a developer is approaching a problem that's already been solved, then do we know what pattern to, what pattern to apply in that scenario? Um, and is your code tested, uh, built to an uh, environment automatically and working and ready to deploy to production? So that is me. I'm going to now pass on to who's up next? Andrew, um, who's going to talk a little bit about Behat and behavior driven development and some of the things we do at Camp Gemini on that.
I've got a slight set technical difficulty here. Okay, sorry about that, a slight technical difficulty. Um, so I'm gonna speak to you about um, behavior-driven development. So um, has anyone heard of BDD or BHAT, stuff like that? Yeah, a few hands going up, good. So they, yeah, there's been a lot of, um, quite a few sessions about BDD and, uh, and stuff from various different camps and, uh, and Drupal comms today. Um, but I've got Philosopher to ask a question. There's a lot of the uh, talks uh, sort of sent around BHAT, which is a PHP driver for doing certain elements of BDD. But um, the question being posed, I'm using BHAT, am I doing BDD? Is quite an interesting one. So just because you're using BHAT, which is uh, like an automation framework, doesn't necessarily mean you're doing BDD. Um, you might just doing behavior, uh, BHAT driven testing, which means you know, you might just be using half of the tool, not necessarily getting the full benefit um, of what you could be doing. And behavior-driven development isn't about tools. It's not about, you know, Behat or Mink or Cucumber or any of these things. Um, so the guy who came up with Behat was a chap called, uh, sorry, with BDD, was a chap called Dan North. And um, a few years ago, he came up with this definition of BDD, the second generation outside in, pool based multiple stakeholder, multiple scale, high automation, agile methodology, which I'm sure is uh, clear to everyone. That's the usual, uh, that's the usual reaction to that. Um, so we can sort of take this apart a little bit in the next uh, few slides, but basically it's um, a process and a framework for actually uh, looking at not, uh, looking at basically the requirements of your project and the behavior of, of your project rather than any necessarily any way of particularly testing. So the, the, the problem we have is one around language and communications. Um, you know, we have generally, in terms of web development, we have complex communication problems. You know, we don't really have technical problems. It's, you know, I'm sad to say it's just PHP and it's just the web. It's not searching for wormholes in distant galaxies. It'll, or searching for cures for cancer. It's just um, PHP. Um, but the reason why we fail a lot is because we don't necessarily communicate um, well or in a standard manner to each other and to all the stakeholders in the project. Um, so we have things like jargon, so people using terms that aren't necessarily well known across all, for everyone. Um, language, so you might be speaking to people whose uh, you know, native languages are, are different, so there are communication issues there. Chinese whispers, where you, know, you don't get direct communication between all the stakeholders, you get message, messages passed down the line and, and things get uh, missed out or confused. Um, and er early solutionizing, and by that I mean um, people, clients coming up with uh, ideas about what they want, uh, or how they want, or ideas about how you s will solve a problem rather than what their requirements are. And you know, unknown unknowns, so you know, if you, were, you think about your last project, and guess how long it would take you to, to redo that project. It would be a lot less time than it took you to actually do the project because you, coming to the end of the project, you know about all the things you, you didn't know about at the beginning of the project. Sound like Donald Rumsfeld there. So the consequence of this kind of language problem is that we're locked in often to delivering late, delayed, or the wrong products, which is even worse, before we've even committed to writing a line of code or written an architecture package or anything like that. And that's neatly kind of summed up in this slide that you've probably all seen before, which is um, one of the classic kind of agile uh, slides. So this is kind of how the customer explained it, but this is what they actually wanted. And these are all the kind of various misinterpretations along the way by various different uh, stakeholders in the project. And this is like classic, and, and we're still doing this, right? You know, everyone's 
still getting these things confused and we're testing the wrong things, delivering the wrong things, not uh, living up to expectations. So, um, you know, TDD was uh, a kind of a, a precursor to, or it's a different way of approaching uh, development. It's where you do um, inside out testing. So you unit test bit, small bits of code. Um, uh, so it's a very kind of uh, granular approach to testing. Um, and it's, you know, often touted as a, as, as a thing to do. And it's a, it is a good thing to do, but it doesn't solve our main problems of, of language and communications. Because uh, it focuses on the how, it focuses on the implementation. Uh, so it presupposes you actually know what you want in the first place. Um, it suffers from a refactoring problem, where you, you know, whereby you can change bits of code, but you don't necessarily want to change the behavior of the whole application. It can only test small, discrete parts of the uh, code base. And also the accessibility problem. So the only people who can actually read and validate these tests are, in all likelihood, mid to senior developers. You know, it's like, quite likely that junior developers may not have the skills or experience yet to, to know what good te TDD tests look like. Um, certainly your QA testing probably can't look at it, and pr almost certainly your client can't validate these tests, and they're the guys who are actually paying for your deliverable. So what is BDD? So it's um, a process, it's a technique for um, looking at requirements. And it combines um, TDD, which is uh, <coughs> some elements of it, which in terms of you, you write it first, it's um, repeatable and it's automated. But it takes elements of uh, this thing called um, domain-driven design, which is, uh, comes out of a book written by a guy called Eric Evans. I don't know if you've read it, but it's, um, it's something that um, anyone who's building software should at least look at. Um, and he talks about describing, the, uh, describing requirements and solutions in terms of the business domain. So, for instance, if you were talking about, um, let's talk about a, a conference side, right? You would talk about sessions and schedules and visitors and things like that. You wouldn't necessarily talk about individual pages or forms because that's not what the, what the solution is about. The solution is about delivering access to, to sessions and booking off sessions and things like that. It's not filling out forms. So you, you speak in the language that the, 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 of the business domain, of the thing you're actually delivering. Um, and you start by looking at business outcomes and come up with behavioral stories. Um, so rather than saying, uh, you, you know, you, you want to drive traffic through this certain uh, funnel, then that's your business outcome. And then you come up with the acceptance criteria to work out what is the best way of <coughs> testing that and understanding and, and showing people how to deliver that. And it's um, supported and it uses, uh, certainly we use a lot of established tools, so things like um, Gherkin is a language, Behat is a testing framework, um, and Jira and Jenkins, which I think Peter Graham just talked about just now. So, but these are kind of uh, established tools that we do use. So um, requirements, this is quite a nice quote on requirements. It's apocryphal, I think, but um, you know, if I asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So it's like, they, you know, you, you, can, you can look at requirements from many different perspectives, but no one person has kind of like the, uh, the, 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 um, the full knowledge of the entire project or the full knowledge of the entire domain. Every team member has come from a different uh, background, they've got different experiences, may have different ways of solving the same problem and can offer many different uh, insights. Um, and so as a team, basically you need to get together with the business stakeholders and discuss your business outcomes and then work out the best way of delivering these. Um, you know, so typically we do that within kind of during a sprint in design clinics or backlog grooming <coughs> sessions, things like that. So you kind of find time to fit these very important sessions in because it's only by you know, directly communicating with the client and the delivery team, the sprint team, that you'll actually come anywhere near getting this, uh, the whole question about requirements and, uh, and, and things like that fixed. And you know, during these sessions, you need to make sure that um, everyone is free to ask questions, everyone's free to question assumptions, breaking the model, and that you go on this kind of uh, path around deliberate discovery. So you, you actually set out to discover things. You kind of admit your ignorance and you sort of go out to uh, work out what is the best method of, of achieving these business outcomes. And what you should 
get at the end of each session is a, a set of acceptance criteria for each of your requirements. Um, ideally in this sort of form, so it's, um, it's in a base kind of standard kind of given when then, which <coughs> basically means it's, it's repeatable, it's, automate, it's able to be automated, and it's also in a language, because if you're using the domain, business domain language, then your testers can look at that, you can validate it, your client can validate that you're actually doing the right thing because they can read the test here. They're not, you know, reading some PHP code, some arbitrary PHP code, they wouldn't know how to interpret. Um, so this is something that we've come up with, which is an acceptance criteria for acceptance criteria. So we try to ensure that all of our acceptance criteria for any particular um, piece of work is complete, so it fully describes everything, so there's no scope for the client to come back and say, actually I meant to do this, or I forgot to tell you about that. So everyone's fully aware of the entire scope of the uh, requirement. But it's clear, so all team members have got a clear understanding, so there's any jargon in there is, uh, you know, jargon's, you know, you're not going to get rid of it, but as long as everyone understands what is meant by each term, then that's fine. And it's testable, so you have specific events that are, you know, repeatable. So you, you push something into the system, you get a fixed set of things out. Uh, so one of the things we do a lot of is systems integration, so we integrate with third-party systems. So you have to work with a lot of things like fixtures. So um, basically you build a set of, uh, you basically use a set of mock objects and, uh, uh, and things like that, kind of uh, mock out your services. So you're not actually calling the back-end services directly because you, you may get sort of the real results out. You just want something you can test against. You want something you can get that is predictable and repeatable. So this is um, this is kind of a, a, a very a very simple, but it's kind of instructive about um, how we might go about looking at a, an acceptance criteria for um, Capgemini's sponsorship of Drupal Comprav. So, so this is uh, this is our feature, and you might recognise this from like a, a, a Scrum and Agile user story. Um, although this this is in terms of actually testing it, this is just here. It's kind of annotation. Um, but you see, as the marketing director, I would see Capgemini's logo on the home page and the sponsor page, that site visitors can see Capgemini's commitment to the Drupal community. It's all well and good. The interesting thing here is we're, we're looking at it from as the marketing director, so not, not as a user, because quite often, you know, everyone writes these user stories as a user, but the user isn't normally, or quite often it's not the reg most often, you know, the regular stakeholder. It could be well, the marketing director, he's a stakeholder in the... In, in the uh, in the deliverable, and he wants to see the um, the logo on the on various different pages. So this is our actual acceptance criteria, and it's just a small dem demonstration one. So given I'm on the home page, then I sh should see the Capgemini logo. When I follow sponsors, and that's just a link on the site, then I should see the Capgemini logo. Now that's a test, and that can be run through Behat. And that's, which means it will be automated. Uh, we run through Firefox, so we can do regression testing on it. We know when we're done, because when this test passes, then we're, then we're done and we're complete. But also, you see, there's nothing about divs or forms or buttons or CSS selectors or anything like that. It's written in the, the domain of the, the problem. You know, the problem domain here is making sure Capgemini logo appears everywhere. So it's a uh, specification. It also acts as documentation, so you can you know, you've got this kind of built-in, organic, evolving documentation as well. So um, it, it acts as that as also as a regression test. Oh, so I'm now going to very quickly switch to a, um, a demo. And hopefully if the Wi-Fi hold, is holding up. So um, just to prove this isn't magic. This is actually the feature we're running, and that's just, nope, oh, you can't see that, can you? Yeah. So, that is the feature we're running. And hopefully if this works. It should fire up Firefox. And it'll just go to the home page and then go to the sponsors page, and it's failed, typically. Never do a live demo. OK, but the, so, so the first one passed, right? So given I'm on my homepage, and I see the Capgemini logo. 
So um, that's a great regression test because obviously somewhere something has failed and we've got red so we can then go back and fix that in our next uh, sprint. So, um, but that's just an example. So that, that can, that, that show you the, the, you know, the, the, the demo can, the, the, the test can be run in an automated fashion, but it's also written in a very clear and plain language. So in summary, um, BDDs isn't about the tools, it's about communication and solving the communication issues. Uh, it's, it's a framework about and a process, um, but it's not about testing. It's also about, the main part is about requirements and d discovery of, uh, of, uh, of the, in the problem domain. Um, got some resources here, so some reading. So these are just some um, blog posts. Um, these are kind of interesting people to follow if you're interested in this sort of thing. Dan North and Liz Keo and Eric Evans. Um, these are some uh, things that are interesting. So BHAT is the testing framework. Um, there's a Drupal extension, which was uh, which is enables you to do um, uh, kind of testing on Drupal sites. So it, it contains vocabularies and grammars for doing testing, like an, you know, testing for anonymous users, testing whether you're logged in, that sort of thing. And uh, Doobie is a project for, Doobie named Doobie, is a project for testing um, Drupal.org. So Drupal.org does some form of BDD testing. So, um, and there's a quick start for, that I've put together for setting up BDD tools and all the framework that you need for that. So that's um, BDD in a 15-minute in a nutshell. I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Graham, who's going to talk about migration. I think you've got a Miss Coyle on there, Andrew, actually. Um, so my name's uh, Elliot Ward. I'm a project lead at Capgemini. Um, and migration is a hot topic when you're dealing with large enterprise sites uh, for a number of reasons. Um, you are not going to be doing an enterprise, uh, uh, enterprise client's very first website, so it's very likely they've got content from an existing site they'll want to start pulling in. It's also, uh, as any of you have been involved with Drupal upgrades, know that they can be very problematic and an alternative strategy rather than using the Drupal upgrade path is actually to build a new site and migrate your content into it. So, the best way to actually perform a migrate is by using the migrate module. There are many other ways you can try and do it uh, using a uh, feeds module, for instance, as an alternative approach. Um, but I realized that I definitely had geek credentials when I realized I had a favorite Drupal module, and it is um, Migrate. Um, it's been around for a while. It's been re-architectured at least once, um, and it's currently got a major re-architecture going on that's currently in release candidates. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about will um, probably change. So, what is it in a picture? <coughs> Migrate is a module that can take data from any of these different sources, uh, pull it in, and then create familiar Drupal entities um, such as nodes, terms, menu items, comments, and users. And it's designed to be completely extendable so that you can have your extension if you find a data source that isn't supported by anybody, and there's those out there in Contrib as well as um, that come with the migrate module, you can extend it to uh, deal with the uh, content types of, or the data sources that you need. And similarly, if you can't find a handler at the end to create your uh, Drupal elements, um, you can create your own here as well. So an example of that, we found there wasn't a particularly good one for migrating uh, mini panels into uh, sites, so uh, we created our own there. So just blowing up that little circle that we just had on Migrate as the, um, as the piece in the middle of that puzzle. There's a few pieces to it. Uh, there's the Migrate module itself. That comes with a Migrate UE in the same way that Views has a Views UE. So you have a separate um, module handling the uh, code for user interface that you can disable when you're actually on uh, production. There's another module called Migrate Extras. Um, and that's becoming deprecated. What that was, that was a kind of collection for all the kind of extra pieces of content around new data sources um, and new um, destinations, different types of data within your Drupal site. Um, but 
that's no longer having new things added to it. The idea is if you create a new content type or something, you distribute it in a feature, if you want to put your migrate support into your own module that you're distributing there. Um, got a few more extra requirements on D6. Anyone still using D6? Lots of D6 still out there. I was wondering whether I should pull that out, but I think there's enough D6 still going. Um, <clears throat> so it uses the autoload that was just included in D7. Uh, it uses uh, DBTNG, Database of Next Generation. So actually, when you're writing your database code, um, you write it in the same way that you would do for Drupal 7. Um, one of the major reasons for using DBTNG in all places is A, it keeps the D6 and the D7 versions of the module uh, as close as they can be from a code point of view. Also, DBTNG is much better at handling multiple databases, which is exactly what you might be doing if you're migrating data from one place uh, to the other. It's also got um, elements in D6 as well, just for some of the uh, UE stuff that's in 7 but not in 6. And unfortunately, because this is the business track, one of the, the final piece that you're going to need to actually do anything with Migrate is implement your own migration module that will have a dependency on Migrate. This is one of the really interesting things that is uh, possibly changing in the latest uh, 726 release candidate uh, because that's going to have a wizard that you're going to be able to use to create your migration structures. A bit like feeds, huh? Pardon? A bit like feeds. <laughs> Um, so it'd be interesting to see how far you can get with that, whether you can implement um, everything or whether you're still going to need to get your hands dirty with code for some of the finer details when you're mapping your data from one place to the other. So what do you need to do in that module? What's the actual work that you're going to have to do when you are migrating your content from one place uh, to the other? The bulk of the work comes by creating uh, subclasses of some of the classes that you will get for Migrate for free. So the class hierarchy for uh, Migrate has this migration class, and you're going to want to subclass that for each type of type of thing that you're going to migrate. So if you've got multiple no types in your destination system, you are going to have to subclass the Migrate node one for each. You're going to have to create a class if you're migrating users, by subclassing migration users class and also um, migration terms. And there's other things that you can uh, migrate in. These are just uh, for some examples that I've pulled off a uh, previous demonstration. For each of those classes, <coughs> you need to um, put them in a migration group. Uh, the migration group doesn't actually have any impact on the data once it's in the destination system. It's more for control and reporting purposes. So you can decide you want to migrate all migration classes in a certain group at a time or just pull up a report on how many have been uh, migrated uh, for a certain group. You need to create a migrate source instance. So you don't need to subclass this if this is one of the already supported data sources that we saw a few slides ago. So if it's for any of these, you don't need to actually create that subclass. Um, there will be one available for you to use, and it's how you actually uh, instantiate that subclass will give you your specific details on what data you want from that data source. Of course, because we've got a MySQL one, we can just hang WordPress, PHP, and Drupal to Drupal uh, site migrations through that one. Um, there is a dedicated one for WordPress now, and there's a separate project for Drupal to Drupal migrate, um, <coughs> but um, you may as well just use the, um, in my experience, use the um, MySQL. Um, source for that. <coughs> you also need to create a migration, migrate destination, and that maps to these items here. So again, we implemented a new migration destination for the mini panels when we found that there was something that wasn't uh, particularly handled uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, create field mappings, so you say where your data is coming from in the source, and then which uh, fields on your destination objects that's going to uh, correlate to. Um, and list anything that you are selecting a data that is explicitly unmapped, or anything that could be put into your destination system uh, where you're not actually going to map it. That doesn't have any practical effect, but it does help you with some of the audit tools that Migrate will provide. You also need to define how your data is mapped between the two systems. 
So you need to tell the migrate module how a particular data element that you're going to select from your source information is going to end up in your destination data. Because all we're doing is pulling this across. So it will build a database table and you need to tell it how to construct these source IDs and the destination IDs. So, so typically the destination ID will just be a node. Um, source ID will completely depend on what the system is that you're migrating from. Okay? And because we've got this map, that means that we can actually run migrate multiple times without migrating the same content unless it's changed. It means that we can accurately map how far our migrate uh, we are and we can batch it effectively as well. Question on that? Yes. So you don't need uh, UUIDs? We will come to that okay. um, and it's interesting and that question comes up every time. I, I have a longer version of this talk where we actually go into a lot more detail. Um, we're kind of flying through it at the moment, but there's a talk online that will be in the references where it actually does demos and code samples um, of an example migrate that's kind of designed to be a really good jump, jump, jumping in point for people who need to get up and running with migrate. Um, <clears throat> so once you've defined all those things, you can actually, the migrate tool, one of the reasons why it's great is it gives you really good auditing tools. So this is going through the UE, but there's equivalent Drush functionality as well. And this is just telling us for some migration classes that we've um, implemented, or we've subclassed, how many um, rows we have to uh, migrate in the, in the source system, how many we've imported so far, how many unimported, and so on. You can also get any messages if we have any failures or anything interesting um, that's happened once we try to update there. So that gives you an overview for all the things that you're going to migrate. You also have auditing on the level of detail here. So um, here, I know these aren't particularly readable, apologies for that, but what this is is a list of fields that we've got in our destination no type. That, and it's showing us either we have mapped them, these are the ones that are already knows where it's going to come from, and down here are the ones we haven't yet mapped. So Migrate is flagging that you could have some data here and it's in your data types. Uh, why haven't you got it in your um, migration? So, uh, helping you to audit how far through your implementation of those Migrate classes you are. If there's anything that you actually don't want to migrate across, you can flag it in your migration classes, do not migrate, and then it will no longer show up in red and you can list it under one of these vertical tabs so you can see. Let Migrate know that you are deliberately not um, importing that data. <clears throat> so that's a very whistle stop tour of how you would implement a migration uh, using the migrate class and I had to give you that so I can highlight some of the difficulties uh, that you might encounter along the way. So um, I put non uh, GUID references or UID but unique IDs as raised um, are an interesting point. Uh, migration order can have an issue, circular references, um, stubbing many-to-one mappings, um, and developing alongside moving targets. And we'll go through these and look at how you might have a strategy for these. So if I've got a kind of relationship between my data here, so this is um, an example from a, from a demo uh, where a monkey has um, an ID mapping to its favorite tree in your source system. When you actually map those across, the IDs that Drupal will allocate the node IDs won't actually be the same. And they'll be pointing in all the kind of wrong, um, wrong elements, maybe pointing at nothing or maybe point at a completely different node type. <coughs> so the way we would deal with that um, in, in this kind of simple case with Migrate is you actually just have to let Migrate know that these are dependent. And then when you run your Migrate, always run the referenced class Migrate first. So here, if we bring in all the trees first and then migrate the monkeys, then there will be uh, no problems and it will remember that it has to work out the new mapping for each one by reference to the map that we set up um, when we were defining our classes. Circular references, a bit more difficult to deal with. Obviously here we've got a monkey that has a relationship with another monkey. Um, so we can't migrate all of these before we migrate all of these because they may point back at themselves, they're the same class. It doesn't make any sense. 
So you will have some work to do here, but Migrate helps you out by having a mechanism by which you can define a stuff. When Migrate comes to migrate one of these data elements, it will have a look and see if the referenced element has been created yet. If it has, there's no problems and it just uses the new reference. If it hasn't, what it will do is it will actually create you a blank node in this instance and it will just remember the mapping for the old value of that reference in the source system and what the new um, reference is. So it will create a blank node and then when it comes to migrate like that later, it will find that it's already stubbed it. The reason we can't use uh, UUIDs to get around this problem is because you may not be in control of that source system. You may not actually be able to go and recode it if it's not already using UUIDs. It's probably a site that you're migrating away from. It could be a staging site. Okay, so another big um, source of problems that you could have is that you are always developing your migration amongst a sea of changing things. You're changing the migration code, so as with anything, you could break it there. But you might also, but you also be having the source content that you're going mi to be migrating. That might still be changing. That might be changing every day. You might still be building the site that you're going to migrate it to. You might actually have existing on the, uh, content on the site that you're going to migrate it to. And you've got your own migration code changes that you're making. All of these are a lot of different things that can cause you uh, problems. So you need to have a robust strategy, going back to what Graham was talking about, having these reliable development processes um, that this is uh, built into. So <clears throat> the way we would uh, typically do this and the way that we did this uh, very successfully for a very large migration we did uh, this year uh, is by a kind of um, continuish integration process with overnight builds where overnight we would take the destination system which was already a live and operational system. We'd pull that back code and database to our test platform. We'd apply all our new code changes immediately to that. And then after we've got our new code, and this could be new code being developed, not just the migration code, but all of the code that's being developed for that site. And then only once we've got all that in, would we actually test the migration. The really important thing about this is you need to do it every day. You need to get your developers to do it every day so they will spot any problems. And you need to get your testers testing it every day. And those testers should genuinely be the people actually writing the content on behalf of the customer as well as your own uh, technical testers. The other things that you um, <coughs> need to be aware of is all those pain points so that you can plan your migration. It's very difficult to predict a timeline for a migration task quickly. You need to find out where all your references are, all your pain points, pull them up out front. And because data migration often gets overlooked compared to functional development, uh, people tend to want estimates quickly because they suddenly realize they haven't done it or haven't allocated time because they were getting the real work done. So. <coughs> I've kind of whizzed through that and some of the potential pain points because we don't have much time, but there is a fuller uh, version of that talk both on Vimeo and the slides on Prezi um, that uh, goes in and has all your um, code and actually live demos of how it reacts when and all the different uh, ways you can audit your uh, migration. Mike Ryan is the uh, driving force behind uh, Migrate. so. Um, have a look at his blog, he blogs occasionally, it's interesting to see um, the contributions that he's making. And also there's a bunch of great extra resources on the Migrate um, project itself on the uh, homepage. So, does anybody have any questions about what either Andrew's talked about or what uh, Graham's talked about or what I've talked about? We've got about five minutes, I think. Yes. Do you have experience also uh, with uh, updating data with Migrate? Uh, so the question was, do we have experience um, of updating data with Migrate? 
Uh, yes, <laughs> we definitely do. So Migrate is designed so that you can run it multiple times on the same day, so it will check that it's been updated um, and then pull in the latest um, content only if it's changed. So you can definitely use it in that configuration. Um, and in that release candidate that I mentioned, there's been some changes around hashing the data in the source system so that you can e more easily identify whether it has changed. Um, when we were doing that large migration, which was tens of thousands of nodes, uh, because our database servers we were running on was so quick, we ran it and were doing other work to do with the, mic um, with the upgrade whilst that ran. And it ran so quickly, we assumed it had failed and rerun it. Um, so you can definitely run it multiple times on the same data set and it won't make uh, further changes. You might want to consider whether you want all that code to be um, enabled all the time if you're using it to do continuous, um, continuous pulling of content. And it may be that something like feeds may be a better fit for that. Yes. So the question is, what's, um, what's your experience of migrating the themes and blocks and other stuff? Uh, so yes, you have to be practical at looking what is content that you're going to migrate and what is content that you are going to put into a feature and implement on your new site that way. So certainly things like um, notes, uh, sorry, content types, definitely put those in features. Um, I'd be anything that's more kind of configuration than content as such, um, I would not look to deploy it with Migrate, although there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't. Yes? Is Migrate a good fit for um, uh, sort of content staging? Or I, mean, I think the normal way is to use deploy, but could you also use the Migrate module for um, like a, a content development server? Uh, yes, you absolutely could use it, um, and we have done um, projects where we have used it in that capacity. M not so much as an ongoing um, deployment. Um, again, it may be that deploy is better suited to that. Um, but yes, you, you certainly could do that, and it would work because you have this repeatable migrate and the and identification of the changed content. You can always um, have a job that will disable migrate um, and then run it, and then run the migrate commands that will actually transfer the data, and then disable uh, migrate after that. Yeah. Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks uh, on behalf of Andrew Graham and I for attending. Thank you. Oh. And if you wouldn't mind uh, rating on the DrupalCon site, um, it really helps to get feedback to work out whether we're talking about the kind of things that people are interested in. <laughs>